Welcome to um, this afternoon session of our BEAT program, Board Education and Training. Um, I'm Ed Zalmansky. I'm a partner in the firm of Zalmansky, Danner, and Fiorito, and I'm the host, uh, video host for this presentation today. Um, Happy New Year to everybody, and um, I'd like you to join in welcoming our pre presenters today. Uh, partner Tracy Danner Bond and Associate Attorney Melissa Francis. With a little bit of a different twist today for BEAT. Um, this doesn't go to board education and training. Rather, um, this is being offered as a free community service to anybody who wants to know uh, more about what they should do uh, with regard to their estate plan, whether um, to start working on a new plan or an updated estate plan. So what's your New Year's resolution? Are you going to be better organized and uh, take care of all that um, documentation, your wills, your trust, get those updated, make sure that they say what you want during this year. Um, and accordingly, Tracy Danner, um, who's mentioned is, is a partner in the firm, and she specializes in complex legal issues facing condominium and homeowners associations, uh, document amendment projects, FHA certifications, and most important for today's presentation, estate planning. And Tracy's going to be joined by Melissa Francis, who had joined the firm back in 2013. So she has a lot of experience with these deep matters, but she also um, has uh, extensive bankruptcy practice experience and real estate collection and estate planning. And so she'll be lending her estate planning expertise to the um, mix today. And so with that in mind, I will ask, um, Tracy, if she would like to commence presentation, what is an estate plan? Thank you, Ed. Generally speaking, an estate plan will consist of a will, a funeral representative designation, a trust, durable powers of attorney, medical powers of attorney, and deeds. Every individual estate plan is geared and designed for that person that comes into our office. So I don't know how many times we've had people come in and say, oh, I talked with my cousin's sister's boyfriend's brother, who is an attorney, and he said, all I need is a will. That's all I need. So we hear that all the time, and we want to make sure that we draft the correct estate plan documents for your specific needs. So Melissa, let's start us off with who needs an estate plan. Everyone needs an estate plan, believe it or not. Um, the estate plan will serve three purposes. It will make sure that your assets are being transferred upon your death according to your wishes, that there is no delay or expense if any of your assets would have to go through probate if you did not name a beneficiary or name where those assets would go in an estate plan. Um, through proper planning. And it also would help reduce the tax obligations um, that one might incur upon inheriting assets. Um, you know, believe it or not, if you just have a bank account, you need to prepare for who's going to take over that bank account or how is the person that you want to inherit that bank account going to get that money and not have to take it through probate. So Tracy, what happens if someone doesn't have an estate plan? There is a misconception that if I am married, all of my assets are going to go to my spouse. That is definitely not the case if you don't have an estate plan. If you don't have an estate plan, your assets may not go to your intended beneficiary. So it's very important that you identify who your beneficiaries of your estate are. And Melissa is going to go into in-depth detail about what happens if you don't have a will and name people to receive your assets. But making sure that your assets go to who you want them to go to is one of the biggest thing, biggest reasons we do estate planning. 
If you don't have an estate plan, it's possible that your, your assets will go through the probate court, like Melissa mentioned. It's very important to take a look at those beneficiary designations. If in Michigan, if you own any assets in your name, even if you have a will, your assets will have to go through the probate court. So the way that we avoid that is to either have another person that's presumably going to outlive us be a joint owner of that asset, which in a lot of cases is not the best option, or a, we can create a trust for you and your trust will be the legal owner of that asset because trusts do not have to be probated. Probatable assets are those assets that are in your name alone. Also, a probatable asset would be a life insurance policy that normally would not be part of probate. But if you ident don't identify a beneficiary who survives you, then the default beneficiary is your estate, which then triggers probate. So there are many reasons why we need to have an estate plan and having your assets go through probate is one of the reasons that we do make sure that all of the assets are identified and distributed properly without the need of probate. Also time and money, like Melissa mentioned, if you don't have an estate plan and your assets are subject to probate, it could take anywhere between a couple of months to a couple of years, depending on the complexity of your estate. So it's very, very important that everyone has an estate plan. Melissa, what assets should have beneficiaries? Well, you should look at, really sit down and make a list of all of the assets that you have. Make sure that you list all of your retirement accounts, your IRAs, any life insurance policies, um, any certificates of deposit that you have, um, bank accounts, um, you know, any assets that you have, vehicles, et cetera. Um, the types of assets that will allow beneficiaries to be placed um, prior to your death upon the paperwork would be retirement accounts, IRAs, life insurance, and certificates of deposit. Um, some banks do allow you to have a beneficiary named on a bank account if you are the sole owner of that bank account. However, that is not always um, the case, but you should always check with your bank. Um, any assets that don't have a beneficiary, regardless of if you are married or if you are um, a surviving child of the person who, whose asset that was, um, if it does not have a beneficiary, even retirement accounts and IRAs will have to go through probate court. I did recently just have a case where the only reason I had to open a probate estate was because somehow the IRA did not have a beneficiary on it. So again, you know, it's good to make a list of all of your assets, think about who you would like to inherit those assets, um, and then make sure that the assets that are um, allowed to have a mark for a beneficiary do have one. Um, I want to tag team on that, Melissa. I, I had a client recently who had an estate plan. Everything was properly in their trust and unbeknownst to them, their father who was deceased had, there was a, an annuity that was out there that nobody knew about. So that annuity had to go through probate court because there was no identified beneficiary. So that's one other thing that you might want to do for yourself and for your family members is to just go on the state of Michigan Department of Treasury website for unclaimed property and just plug your name in and see if there's something out there that maybe when your mom and your dad sat down with you and said, okay, these are my assets, maybe they forgot about something. So do check on, on that website, plug your name in, make sure that you've got everything that you know of and your assets covered. Right. And you want to make sure that you do that um, when you are making your estate plan or during the time that you are living, because if that asset is found after the time of your death, not only would your heirs have to open a estate, a probate estate for you, um, someone else would have to open a probate estate or their heirs would have to um, do a probate estate probate estate for that person that you would be able to inherit that annuity from. So it would be a double whammy in probate court. So Tracy, how do I know what documents I need for my estate plan? Like I mentioned before, we get calls all the time where people will tell me, oh, I just, I just need a will. That's all I need. Maybe, maybe a power of attorney, but I just need a will. I don't really have anything. I, I find that most people have more assets than they think that they do. 
So prior to any meeting with an estate planning attorney, make a list of all of your assets. What real estate do you have? How is it owned? Is it jointly owned? Is it owned by you? Or is it owned by you and your brother? It's a good idea to bring a deed, a copy of the deed to your real estate with you when you see that estate planning attorney so that they can see exactly how that property is held legally. Also, bank accounts. We mentioned bank accounts are very important. Who owns that bank account? Is it a joint bank account? Can your bank have that beneficiary designation added or it's also called a payable on death designation? Life insurance, people often forget about life insurance. That's an asset of your estate. CDs, stocks. Most people don't own stocks in their name anymore. They own stocks through brokerage accounts or money market accounts. However, I have come across several people that still have those original stock certificates. Well, if you own that stock certificate in just your name, it is subject to probate. So we need to either transfer it into a trust or possibly sell that, that stock if it's just hanging on. Make that list, bring that list to your meeting with your estate planning attorney. The attorney will then review all of your assets and talk through with you what options are out there. Do I need a trust? Maybe I don't need a trust. Maybe I can, all of my assets have beneficiary designations and the only thing that doesn't is my house. Well, in that case, we can do what's called a ladybird deed or an enhanced life estate deed, and that will avoid probate. So your estate plan is triggered or targeted just for you based on your individual circumstances. So regardless of what your sister might have for her estate plan, yours will be geared toward you. So you can't assume that you will have what your brother has or your sister has or your sister's cousin's brother's wife. So definitely make that list of assets for yourself. And when you go in and talk with your estate planning attorney. Melissa, what happens if my wife and I die, won't all of my assets go to my wife when I pass away? Why do we even need an estate plan if everything that I own is joint? The only assets that will go directly to your spouse upon your death would be any assets that are properly set up to provide rights of survivorship, like a deed with a joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, or something that you've named your spouse on as a beneficiary. So a retirement account, an IRA, um, a bank account that you own jointly, et cetera. Um, any assets that aren't properly set up will have to go through probate court and um, any of your other heirs can potentially um, contest that transfer um, in the probate court. Um, the Michigan statute does set out that your spouse is entitled to the first 150,000 of assets that would need to go through probate, but anything over that 150,000, um, the court has to distribute to your spouse and to your heirs per statute. So the in the probate court, your spouse is not going to be guaranteed to inherit everything. So you know, planning is the best solution here because, you know, when somebody passes away, especially if it's unexpected, um, even if it's not unexpected, um, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of things that need to go on and just having an estate plan or a will um, and all the pieces of the puzzle in place just make it easier for your, for your family. Um, so Tracy, in order to pass things to my children, can I just add them on the deed of my house so I can just have them on my my property so when I die they can inherit it? You could, but it is not recommended. One of the three things that are big reasons why we should not just simply add adult children to title to our real estate is liability issues. If you add someone to your property, you are opening up yourself to additional liability. For instance, if I were to add my adult son to the deed to my home and my adult son gets into a car accident and injures someone, he's then sued, obtains a judgment against him. Any assets that he owns or has any interest in would be subject to collection on that judgment. Well, that opens up liability to me because my house is now jointly owned with my son. And if my son's assets in his name alone aren't enough to satisfy that judgment, it's possible that my house 
might be subject to that judgment as well. So for liability purposes, we do not want to add adult children or anyone other than our spouse for that matter to our, our real estate specifically. Yeah. And Tracy, when you're speaking about liability, um, if you put your, your child on your deed and your child has creditors, that also opens up your child's creditors to be able to um, collect against your property if your child isn't paying their debts. Um, one big thing is if your child files a bankruptcy case and they're on the house, especially if it's a chapter seven, they've got to disclose that as an asset. And more than likely, because if that's not their primary residence, they're not going to have enough exemptions to be able to take that and exempt it from uh, being able to be sold and distributing their portion of the proceeds amongst their creditors in bankruptcy. So that's, we see that in, in bankruptcy practice, we see that a lot. People don't think about that ahead of time. And then um, you have a client who is trying to maintain the home that they share with their mother. And I know that people think that simply adding their adult children will make things easier on everyone. And it, that's just simply not the case. There are other ways to make it easy on yourself and your family members to deal with your assets when you pass away, but simply adding them to a deed is not the right way to do it. Another reason we don't want to do that is the loss of step up and basis. So what I mean by that is when you say, for instance, I purchased my home many, many years ago for $50,000. I then add my adult son to my home. Currently, the value is $300,000. My adult child will not, his, his basis in that asset will be my basis, which is $50,000. So if I pass away and the value is $400,000, he then will not receive a step up on basis at my death. So the capital gains tax that could be an issue would be the difference between, say he, he sells it for 450,000 value at my death was 400. His basis is 50. So the difference between 450 and 50 is going to be subject to capital gains tax. If we were to deal with that property at death, either through a ladybird deed or through transfer at death through a trust, my son would get a step up in basis to the value at my death, which is that $400,000. He then sells it at value of 450. The capital gains tax would be subject to that $50,000. So, so there would be potential capital gains tax on that 50,000 versus 450 or 400. So the loss of that uh, step up in basis and the capital gains tax issues are significant. So those on top of the liability issues are reasons we don't want to add our adult children to the deed to our home. Melissa, do I need to do something special because I have minor children? Yes, this is super, super, super important. You may think that all you need to do is tell whoever you want to be the guardian of your children, hey, you, if I die, can you take my kids? They say yes, and that's it. But it's a lot more complicated than that. And actually having it written out and solidified um, in a proper estate plan will make it a lot easier for you, for your relatives, and for your children in order to um, to get that process going smoothly. So um, you will need to name your guardians for your children, provide instructions as to how the current assets are to be used for the support of your children, and what to do with those assets once those children reach adulthood. Um, a lot of people do put in provisions regarding um, utilizing certain amounts of those assets for education purposes for children. Um, the trustee of the trust um, will have the ability to distribute property as they see fit for the care, feeding, and education of your children. Um, but anything that is left after that, um, you do have the ability in your estate plan to put that your children get a certain amount of money at certain ages. Um, most people don't say you turn 18 and you can give your child all of the money. Um, it's, you know, it's not a carte blanche, but, you know, as they get older, they can inherit more and more money. And then you know that they're set for life. 
Melissa, I think we lost your share screen. You did. So can you double, double check on that for us? And I also want to add to that, again, if you have a trust set up for your minor children, which we highly recommend, you can adjust that as your child. I mean, say you set up your estate plan when your children are five and six years old, and you really don't know how responsible they are going to be during their lifetime. You can make changes to that estate plan and you can adjust the ages of distribution. And the ages of distribution are when that successor trustee cuts a check to them and says, here you go, make good choices, good luck. And if they want to blow it on a car, they could blow it on a car, but know that the successor trustee will always have the option of utilizing that money in trust for the child for their benefit, for their health, their education, their well being. So if they want to go to college and they don't have enough money that they have access to immediately, the trustee can cut a check to the college and fund their education. Melissa, I'm still not seeing your shared screen. Okay, I am looking at it on my live stream. Okay. Well, so I don't know what is Maybe I am just not I seeing apologize. it. I apologize. That's okay. Um, so there's a question, is it recommended to place an adult child as the guardian of other minor siblings? Um, I think that that will have to be based on a case-by-case -case basis because you need to judge the maturity of that um, adult sibling and you know, what is the dynamic between the siblings? Like, what is the responsibility level? You know, what level of um, respect do the younger siblings have for the older sibling and how easy or, you know, how well would the older sibling adjust to being in a situation where they're more of a parent than a sibling? I've actually had clients that have wanted to do that. And we, I, I had to set it up in a very interesting way because the, the older sister hadn't turned 18 yet, but the parents knew that absolutely if something happened to them, that, that once she turned 18, they wanted her to take care of her younger 14-year-old sister. However, they also wanted to have um, their, the, the aunt just bless that whole guardianship. So it was, it was a very unique situation. We can be as creative as, a, creative as you need us to be with your estate plan. And again, any of the documents that we draft for clients can be revised, whether it's pitching the trust and starting over or just amending certain sections, but we can be as creative as you need us to be based on your certain circumstances. Yeah. I also think if you are going to want an older sibling to potentially be the guardian for younger siblings, you need to sit down and talk to that older sibling and see where they feel they are in the process and if they're ready to handle it. Because I think if you don't talk to them beforehand and then all of a sudden, hey, I am the guardian for my three little brothers or sisters. That's a big shock in the face of everything else that potentially would be going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Tracy, when should I update my estate plan? Oh, the attorney's favorite answer. It depends. It depends yeah. on, have you purchased more assets or inherited assets or invested money? in accounts that have beneficiary designations since you last did your estate plan? Have you had a life-changing experience where you got married or you had children or a beneficiary died? So depending on your circumstances, again, this is all tailored to you. There's no magic time, but every five, three to five years, I mean, if you just wanna pull it out and take a look at it and say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, my son is not going to be ready for a distribution of, of any type of money at age 25. We need to change that. But the major life changes, marriage, divorce, uh, birth of children, um, grandchildren, we can also uh, make adjustments for grandchildren if, if grandchildren are now in the picture. Um, again, and other assets, especially real estate, because if you've got a trust in place and you purchase a vacation home in Florida, we need to make sure that that vacation home gets put into your trust so that it does not go, have to go through probate. Melissa, will my children have to pay inheritance tax when they receive my assets at my death? Currently, that is um, 
the answer to that is probably not because as of January 1st, the current estate tax exemption is 12.06 million. So if if you have over 12.06 million, then yes, your your children or whoever inherits your estate will have to pay estate tax. But at this point, um, if your assets are under 12.06 million, um, no. And the increased exemption um, currently will go through, is set to go through December of 2025. So um, for the near future, the answer is most likely no. And um, so, but Tracy, what if the tax exemption amount goes back down? Like what are the, what are the possibilities that they would have to pay a state tax? Like you mentioned, Melissa, currently that exemption is set to expire on December 31st of 2025. Beginning in 2026, if the legislature hasn't changed anything, then the estate tax exemption amount will go back down to 5 million per person. Now, an earlier version of the Build Back Better Act included a provision that would have cut the exemption in half starting 2023, not waiting until 2026, but that section was eliminated in the text from November 3rd. So we're not sure what's going to happen with the government, what kind of changes they'll make to the estate tax exemption. I don't foresee that whatever changes do take place will trigger having to go back to estate plan documents where each spouse has their own trust in order to shelter money from estate tax. I just don't see that happening for most people. I mean, generally speaking, most married couples don't have more than $5 million in their gross estate currently. So I don't see that it's going to go down low enough where we won't still be able to use a joint trust for a married couple. Melissa, can someone contest my will or trust? Um, yes, it is rare that a trust would be contested just because of the way that it's written and the fact that people that are not included in the trust are generally not privy to what is in the trust or entitled to know what other people inherited or not. But if you just have a will or something that needs to be probated, then yes, 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 yes. People can definitely come and contest what is there. Um, but the best way to make sure that nothing is contested is making sure that you speak with your attorney about any challenges that you may be having in estate planning um, and splitting up your heirs, making sure that your heirs know um, how you are potentially going to split up um, the assets and why you're doing it that way. Um, make sure that your estate plan is properly executed. So make sure that it's um, signed. Make sure that um, you pass the test, which we'll talk about um, later on um, regarding competency and making an estate plan. Um, and again, discuss um, any issues that you can think of with your estate planning council and actually listen to any precautions that they suggest and take them into consideration because that's why you hire an attorney is to help you to plan and help you to do this the easiest way possible. Um, so Tracy, leading into that, what if I know that my kids don't get along and I'm leaving them unequal shares of my estate or I'm leaving um, nothing to one or more of my children? Had clients that have come in and said, okay, I haven't talked to my adult son in four years and I have no relationship with him and I'm not planning to leave him anything. We can definitely draft your estate plan documents in a way so that it recognizes that you have not included them. It needs to be specifically spelled out. For instance, I have, you know, here are my children and, you know, I've got a son, I've got a daughter, and I have intentionally and purposely not included my son in the distribution of my assets for reasons known to him. That's a generic response to, I don't really want to get into details, but he knows why I'm not leaving anything to him. Um, inevitably, I've also had clients come in and say, well, my, uh, my oldest daughter, she married this amazing man who has millions and millions and millions. So she's all set. But my, my younger daughter, she's a single mom of six. Her husband passed away and she's struggling. So I'm just going to leave everything to her, to my youngest daughter. Well, that's fine. But my response to them is, well, 
your daughters are going to see that, that, and, and you might not see it this way, but they may perceive it as a different amount of love that you have for one daughter than the other. And circumstances might change with that older daughter. She might get a divorce and they may have had a prenup and now she has nothing. And now you've left everything just to the youngest daughter, because when you drafted your estate plan, she was struggling. Well, now she's doing great. Older daughter is not doing great. So these are the things that you really need to think about if you're going to leave unequal shares. You can still do it, but think it through and your attorney will talk to you about the consequences. And the biggest thing that I see is, is those children will perceive it as a different amount of love. You love my younger sister more than you love me and be very, very hurt. So think about those things. The other th way that we can prevent potential will contests or trust contests, if there's unequal shares, is to have the attorney with the witness that is there when the client signs the documents to ask specific questions. You know, are you leaving a, a, an equal distribution? No, I am not. Why is that? And have the client explain that with that witness there. Then the attorney can prepare an affidavit explaining exactly what the client said. They can sign that affidavit. The witness can then sign an affidavit. And that shows present intent of that client of they know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. So absolutely you can leave unequal shares. I don't recommend it, but we can certainly address those issues in the documents. And that's another reason why you need to have an estate plan to make sure that your assets are distributed according to your wishes. Melissa, I am married. Do I have to have a joint estate plan with my husband or can I have my own? No, you can have your own estate plan and you also don't even have to use the same estate planning counsel as your spouse would use. Um, the biggest things if you are going to do your own estate plans is anything that you do own jointly, make sure that each um, attorney that is representing each spouse knows about those joint assets and make sure that you know, you know, you are in agreement as to what is going to happen with those assets and your portion of those assets. Um, the you know, a big reason why people may want to have separate estate plans is um, that they brought different assets into the marriage um, that were 100% theirs and they are not um, splitting and they don't want to share with um, other heirs. They just want to make it easy. Um, but an, one big reason why there may be um, estate plans that are separate is that this could be a sec. sec the, sorry, a second marriage, and they could have children from a previous marriage. Um, and Tracy can talk further about how those can be set up. Blended families are definitely, uh, we see them more today than we ever have. And I think it's wonderful, you know, people finding love the second time around. That's fantastic. And most people have had children with their first spouse. And then you bring that family together and you've got the Brady Bunch. And so there are different ways that we can deal with blended families. You can have separate estate plans. You can keep your assets separate. I have clients that have decided my spouse's children are just like my own children. I consider them my own children, even though they're my stepchildren. And so for estate planning purposes, we have decided together as a couple that we want our combined four children to be treated as if they are ours. And even though they were born of different spouses. So the most important thing when you've got a blended family is you and your spouse need to talk about what happens when one of you passes away. If you've got adult children, do say I pass away first. If I have adult children, I might want my husband to give them some of my personal property now after right after I died, instead of waiting until he passes away. So you can make provisions in your estate plan documents for that. You can uh, do specific gifts for your adult children so that if you have combined everything, maybe your adult children receive a distribution of a specific gift of 10,000 or 15,000 or some amount of money upon that parent's death. So there's all kinds of different ways that we can do it again, tailoring it to your circumstances. I've also had clients that have had blended families where they have, each of them have their own trust, and then they created a joint trust 
and funded that joint trust with all of their joint property. So the marital home is now a joint asset that got put into the trust and is, and is treated specifically according to the terms of that trust. So again, we can deal with your situation however you want us to, to deal with that situation. And we'll give you ideas too. It's not like you need to come into our meeting and say, okay, I did all this research and this is how I want to do it. And I need one trust and this trust and that. We will help you with that. But come to that first meeting with an idea generally of how you want to distribute your assets. And then we'll go from there and make sure that everything is put into place as you would like it. Melissa, let's talk about powers of attorney. What is the difference between a durable power of attorney and a medical power of attorney? So a durable power of attorney is a power of attorney that can be used to give someone the ability to manage your general affairs. So they can sign banking documents. They can make deposits or be on a bank account with you. They can do real estate transactions for you. They can sign basic contracts for you. Um, so a durable power of attorney is basically, it can also be called a general power of attorney. Um, and though that power of attorney can be made effective either um, upon execution. So if you want, um, say I wanted to do a power of attorney and have my mom be able to right away help me to do a um, business. So if I was going overseas or something and I need someone to sign documents while I was away, I could do a power of attorney that was effective upon execution. So if I executed it today, my mother would be able to go and sign documents today on my behalf. Um, or if I only want someone to have the ability to manage my affairs. Um, if I become disabled, I can do a durable power of attorney that is only effective upon a disability. So that the only way my mother could do business is if I have been determined to be disabled and I cannot do business for myself. Um, I just want to jump in and add, uh, I had a client years ago, husband and wife, and the wife was legally competent mentally she was spot on but she developed a neurological disorder and she was not able to sign documents on her own anymore and she had a power of attorney effective upon a disability and that is probably the best example of I uh, that I can come up with with what would trigger a, you know what type of of disability would trigger that durable power coming into play and I also wanted to, to add to that Melissa in Michigan you have to specifically state po the powers that you want to give your agent under that power of attorney. There is no implied powers. You have to spell them out. So I know that uh, in some of my newer powers of attorney, people are having digital assets that they need people, their agent to handle, and they want to give access to their cell phones and their computers and passwords. So you need to identify exactly what powers you are giving that agent in that power of attorney. If it's not on that list, they can't do it. Also, even if and under Michigan law, you cannot have your agent change beneficiaries of life insurance. You cannot have them um, create a will for you. So there are certain things under Michigan law that you cannot give your agent the ability to do, but otherwise you have to spell those powers out on that document or they will not have them. Correct. Um, and then a medical power of attorney, um, you know, it might be a little easier to decide who you want to have your general power of attorney than your medical power of attorney. Um, your medical power of attorney is going to also be your appointed pa patient advocate. Um, a medical power of attorney is only effective upon disability. So you really want to think about and maybe talk to the person who you um, would like to appoint your medical power of attorney and find out if they're on the same page with you as to what your final wishes would be regarding um, end of life care. Um, you know, if you are not comfortable or you do not want to be put on life support, and you talk to the person that you want as your medical power of attorney, and they don't think that they would be able to withhold life support from you, then that's probably not the best person to have as your power of attorney. So it, it really is best if you think about the choices that you want to make for yourself and then try to find someone who can execute those choices when you don't have any say and they can't have a conversation with you. Um, right. 
And, and just to add to that, that power of attorney comes into play only when you can't make those medical decisions for yourself. So unlike the other powers of attorney, that one comes and goes. I mean, it depends on medically, are you able to make those choices yourself? If that's the case, then you make those choices. If you can't, that's when your patient advocate steps in. And I definitely recommend that all of my clients that have signed powers of attorney talk to their patient advocates about what they want, like Melissa said, for the end of life treatment, because it's going to be so emotional for your family to be in that situation. If you give your children and your family an opportunity to accept what your wishes are now while you're still here and go through that process, it's going to be easier for them to, in that moment, make sure that your wishes are, are provided for and that there's that emotional part. I mean, they're still going to be emotional, but the shock of, oh my gosh, mom wants me to pull the plug is not there because you knew in advance that if these certain circumstances happened, mom would not want to be on life support. So take that as much emotional part of it away now and talk to them about it so that they can accept it, talk to you about it. And then when that time comes, it might be at least a little bit easier. Right. And, and the newer um, medical power of attorney forms um, as well, there are some time periods that you can set out for certain actions to take place. So, um, you know, some people say if you're in a coma for seven days, then go ahead and, you know, if there's no chance of recovery, um, then execute the final plan. But some people wait longer. It's just, it's a matter of what you feel comfortable with ultimately and what you feel will be best for your um, patient advocate and what they would feel comfortable with. So, um, Tracy, if a parent has dementia, um, can they still make changes to their estate plan? If they are legally incompetent, they may not sign estate plan documents or any legal documents for that matter. So there is a testamentary capacity test that attorneys will go through if you've got a client who possibly has the early signs of dementia. So under Michigan law, there are four requirements that have to be met to establish testamentary capacity. Does mom understand that she's signing a document that determines how her property will be distributed at her death? So talking through with mom, okay, do you understand where your assets will go upon your death? Does mom have the ability to comprehend the character and amount of her property? Does mom know what assets she does have? Can she tell you, yes, I have a bank account. I've got real estate. I've got life insurance. Does she know what assets she currently has and how they're going to be distributed? Does mom know the natural objects of her bounty? And what that means is, does she know the, who the family members are that will inherit her assets? Does she understand who they are? Does she know that they're her children? Can she tell you their children's names? Can she tell you if they have grandchildren? I ask questions about birthdays and you know some people just don't re remember those things, but they need to know who their children are. They need to know who their grandchildren are. They need to be able to tell you that they're aware of how their assets are going to be distributed and who they're going to go to. And does mom have the ability to understand in a reasonable manner the general nature and effect of her act in signing the document? So again, does she understand what she's doing? Is this what she wants? And anytime I have a client that is brought by a family member, I, I will have that family member sit throughout the meeting if the, the client wants to. But when it comes down to confirming what that client wants as far as distribution of assets, I will ask that family member to step out and have an individual conversation with that client and ask them questions. Does your daughter, you know, did your daughter ask you to, to distribute your assets this way? Did your daughter um, tell you that she's not going to let you stay at her house if she doesn't receive all the assets? Is, are you sure that this is how you want to distribute your assets? So you need to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with your client just to confirm that she knows what she's doing. Yes, this is what she wants to do. And no one unduly influenced her in that way. Again, if there's a question of competency, I would also prepare an affidavit of my conversation with the client and talk about the 
testamentary capacity questions. And I've got a form that I fill out when I do that test just to confirm and have that in my file. So yes, the day that she came in to, to sign things, mom was totally with it. She knew what she was doing and this is what she wanted. All right. So we have come to the end of our presentation and um, we are, Tracy and I are both available to do questions and answers. So if there are any questions, um, if you would like to put your question in the chat to Ed, he can ask those questions for us. And we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Keep in mind too, if you are under too much pressure to get your question now, feel free to email both of us. Our email addresses will be on the last slide. You can always call us at the office if you've got questions. And if you're on Facebook, you can put um, your question into the comments on Facebook and um, we will answer them that way. And do we have any questions? Melissa, I don't see any questions in chat for you or Tracy. Okay, and I don't, I just received a message from Marcia that there are no questions on Facebook. So at okay. this, so at this point, we would like to thank you so much for joining us. And again, as Tracy said, you can um, email us or call us um, if you have questions. Our phone number, Tracy and I are both in the Plymouth office, is 734-459-0062. Tracy's email is tdannerbond at zdfattorneys.com. My email is mfrancis at zdfattorneys.com. So if you have questions or if you would like a copy of the presentation, please send us an email and we will get that to you. As always, we thank you for spending your lunch hour with us and we welcome you to please look at our Facebook page, our Instagram, our uh, Twitter, and most importantly, look at our website, www.zdfattorneys.com and go to our YouTube channel, ZDF Condo. And you can see all of the pro past beat presentations that we've done. So thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.